Jabber. Hey, can you be? Yeah, if we have, if somebody could be logged into Jabber if, in case we have questions. Thank you. It's cooler in here now. Yeah, there's. Oh yeah, we're all here. <laughs> no, no, no. The temperature has dropped. Yes, yes, it is. Substantially. I feel sorry for you. <laughs> All right. All right, we'll get started with some of the formalities here. So welcome to EMU at IETF 101. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with NoteWell, and this is probably a little bit of an eye chart, but you might actually be able to read it in this room. Um, if you're not familiar with it, I suggest you familiarize yourself with uh, the rules of participation here. This is the new text. I had to change the text and re-upload the slide, so this is brand new. What's that? I don't know. I don't know which way. The emu in this picture? All right. So we have minute takers, jabber scribes. The blue sheets are going around. Please sign them. Uh, just a reminder to uh, state your name at the mic when you speak. Um, and always keep it professional. <laughs> Stormy, Daniels. Stormy Daniels is a professional. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we have we have a full agenda, um, and we'll get started with that just uh, in just a minute. Um, I did want to quickly go through uh, just there are particular items on the charter, and I believe we have presentations that cover all of these, which is an awesome start to the working group. Um, so we have clarifications of uh, EPTLS and its use with TLS 1.3, and also some discussion on how you know improving the handling of large certificate chains. Um, then there's a couple EAP AKA topics. I don't see Yari yet, so hopefully he will be here to talk about that. Um, and then uh, Alan was going to talk about some uh, fast uh, uh, so the EAP identity, session identity, yeah. There are some inconsistencies or gaps in, in those definitions. Um, we go back, somehow I can go back on this thing. We also have uh, Elliot Lear, who I don't, oh, I do see Elliot here, and he was gonna, you know, pose some questions to the group uh, coming from the perspective of Brewski and enrollment and, and that that sort of thing and, and how EAP or TEEP might be involved in that. So as people trickle in here, um, let's get started with, uh, let's see if I can see which slide is which these are your slides John okay now there is a microphone somewhere yeah see that one I think you have to get I was told you have to get very close to that mic uh, okay yeah so maybe even closer yes. yeah here yeah. good um, so this talk is about using ETLS with TLS 1.0 Three. Uh, yeah. Next slide. Uh, <clears throat> EPTLS is, as you know, widely supported for authentication in Wi-Fi. Uh, but the use cases has been growing over the year. It's now also the default mechanism for certificate-based authentication in the multifier standard and 3GPP 5G access networks. Uh, 5G access networks was just standardized, so this is not deployed other in test. 
space. Uh, I don't know how much people know about TLS 103, but it's basically a complete remodeling of the TLS handshake protocol, including a different message flow, different handshake messages, different key schedule, different service suits, different resumption, and it adds encryption which leads to different privacy protection. Uh, this means that significant part of the old ETLS part specification are no longer applicable. And that means both high level from a, how the message flows are, but also to low level details which uh, mess contents you have in the different messages. Uh, but <clears throat> I think people definitely want to use TLS 103. It pro provides significantly improved security privacy and reduced latency. Uh, <clears throat> so TLS draft maps on TLS updates the old draft was discussions on the list uh, very much thanks to Alan and uh, Bernard yeah, for the many comments and also Jim. Uh, uh, I think the draft now is in a pretty good shape and it only lists additional <clears throat> or different requirements compared to uh, RFC 5216 or TLS 103. Next slide. So here is a high level overview. Uh, what is changed? So here is an ETLS hand message flow when you're using ETLS 1.0, 1.1, or 1.2. They all look the same. And if you look at ETLS when you use TLS 103, it looks quite different. And what has changed is that you have, for example, here in the client, what the client sends, you have different messages. The server basically only sends, instead of two blocks of messages, only sends one with different context. And basically, you also get rid of a whole single round trip, which is no longer needed in when you do TLS 103. Okay. Yep. Yeah, next slide. Uh, <clears throat> so a little more, more into the what details, what difference. Resumption works different in TLS 103. It replaces the earlier session resumption mechanism, there were several, with a new PSK exchange. Um, as discussed on the list, the PSK P shared key exchange cannot be used except for uh, resumption. Uh, and the resumption also works a little bit different. Uh, when you use TLS 103 with resumption, you need to indicate, the server needs to sub indicate support of resumption in the initial authentication. And to do this, it sends a new sec session ticket message which contains a PSK, a PSK identifier, and some other parameter. And if, if the client has received such a new session ticket, it can use that PSK identity and the PSK to negotiate resumption. And then it's up for this. Typically, if you have a ticket and it's valid, you should do resumption. And typically, if the ticket is valid, the server should accept uh, resumption. And I think next slide we can see example on how this looks. Uh, so basically here is the Arduino handshake and then after the client authentication the server sends a TLS new session tickle, ticket to the client. So you get one additional round trip there and then when you do a resumption it's a simple TLS 1.3 handshake, but with PSK. So there's no certificate authentication in the reception. Questions? Yeah. Next. Privacy is another thing that handles 
can be handled very differently. TLS 1.3 increases and simplifies the privacy by encrypting a large part of the TLS handshake. In earlier versions of TLS, large part of the handshake were not encrypted. For example, this certificate was sending clear text, which meant that to use EPTLS with privacy, the client sent an empty certificate list and then you re redid the handshake basically twice. In TLS, there's no need to do that. Everything here in yellow are always encrypted, including both the servers and the client's certificates. So you basically get the privacy features for free. And of course, in EAP, you also send an identity here early before you start TLS. So then you need to use an anonymous identifier. Um, and the current draft says that you, you must use an uh, anonymous identifier when you know that the server supports TLS 103. Yeah, that, that's going to be a follow-up. Can you use the mic, please? Sorry. Um, uh, Bernard Boba from Maxa. The problem, though, is if you don't know, right, and you start that, then you're going to fail. So it's it's kind of weird, like, and the problem is, yeah, you, so you're starting off, you don't really know whether the other guy does. You can't you can't really include it. Then you've kind of leaked your identity, and even if you come back, right, people can. So anyway, uh, yeah, I'm not sure how you solve that, but that's that's kind of it. There's there's a gotcha in there. Yeah, I agree. There's a, this is basically the only area. I, I I think there is more clarification needed. But I think this is already a problem with early version TLS. There's no way to know that the server in EPTLS ever supports privacy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Next slide. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not that this is El Elliot Lear, sorry. Not that this is an objection at this point, but just a, a, a note of, you know, an observation, which is if people are doing radius proxy functionality and they need the information uh, that are in the certificates, they're going to lose that in 1.3. So some people, will, I think, will view that as a feature, and some people, some people may view that as a, a problem, uh, depending on uh, one's perspective. And I just want to note that that's an issue there. Sorry, just to just to clarify that, um, I'm not aware how you can do half the EAP conversation and then proxy it. So the the, the issue, speaking from this, sorry, this is Alan DeCock from Radius. The issue is that once you start the EAP conversation, you either do all of it or you proxy all of it. No, it's, it's, it's Radius versus EAP. So what I'm saying is, is in in the radius layer, you proxy based on the identity, and that happens no matter what happens inside EAP. And sort of looking at the certificate and then deciding whether or not to proxy it is something that's rather a lot more complicated and typically not done. Yariak, I'm also trying to understand what the case actually here is, and maybe you guys were just uh, speaking past each other. Are you, Elliot, uh, suggesting that there's a uh, like an EAP goes end to end, and then there's one of the proxies in 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 path is looking at the EAP traffic, even inside EAP TLS, and looking at the certs. Is that the case that you're we thinking have, of? We have a use case. I'm, I'm aware of one use case that we're considering. Sorry. I'm aware of one use case where we're considering doing exactly that, where we're going to split essentially different functionality out. And we don't have to respond directly, but if we have the uh, if we have the certificate information, we have enough information with which to to make um, decisions that would then uh, that might otherwise be made directly by the Radius server. And so uh, and so there are a couple of it's a fairly involved use case, but having that information hidden. Um, is is going to close off some of those use cases. We can again, as I said, it could be considered a benefit or 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 negative, and I can flesh that out a little bit more over time. But this is this is something that that we have to I think understand a little bit more in the EAP use case. Yeah. 
is is this work going on in another working group or is it proprietary? It's proprietary at the okay. moment, but it okay. may not be for long. So another thing that changes is the key hierarchy. Uh, TLS. Can I? Uh, yeah, so, sorry, I was slow, um, but I wanted to follow up um, still some more on, on, on this topic. So that's a, the, the use cases that you or anybody else in this room know of are not current. They are upcoming or future ones. I can't speak to the ones I know of are not current. There may be others that, uh, I mean, greatest proxy. So just to try and close that out, um, I think watching the traffic and then proxying or not based on peaking inside of EAP but not actually terminating it, that's, uh, I, I would say that's a hard no. Um, if you want to terminate EAP and then after you've decided to authenticate the user, somehow ask someone else whether or not they really should be authenticated, that's more possible. But I would say that's largely outside the scope of EAP. Um, and it, it, it can be possible, I and mean, people do this today. Yes, your certificate's okay, let me look you up in LDAP. Oh no, you're, ex you know, you're, you're no longer allowed. That's done today, and I, I think whether or not that's LDAP or SQL or, or, or further proxying is all fine and is compatible with this. So the key hierarchy changed. Um, TLS 1.3 replaces the set random function used in early versions. They're slightly different in 1.1 and 1.2. Uh, 1.3 completely replaces it with HKDF. And it also completely changes how keys are derived. Uh, here I think a specification is needed to avoid non-interoperable implementations. Um, and the suggestion in this draft is to use the <clears throat> TLS exporter, which is what the function TLS 103 has made exactly for this use case. And this is what Quick is using. And it's very simple. And then all the other, these are basically the three things you need. Then all the other e specific things can be derived exactly as in. EPTLS RFC 5216. Fragmentation. <clears throat> so this, <clears throat> there was a lot of discussion, quite a lot of discussion on the list regarding fragmentation and the problem that uh, some, <clears throat> some nodes cut off the communication after 30, 40 packages. Uh, so I added quite a lengthy section to the draft to explain things that can be don done to avoid or at least limit uh, fragmentation, reduce the number of packages. And this has become easier with TLS 103 than earlier versions. Alan? Uh, my two cents is that could probably be split out into a, a separate document because we probably do want recommendations for earlier versions of TLS. And as my message on the mailing list said, right, I mean, you can bloat certificates out with names, addresses, groups, OIDs, and that's completely independent of, of any of this. But there should be recommendations separate from 1.2 and earlier from 1.3. Uh, Mohit, so my, my initial feeling was 1.3 recommendations stay here and anything before 1.3, so for what's already deployed, should be a separate document. Of these, I think, so let's go through them. I think one, one thing is to use mechanisms to get the uh, certs or certificates changed as small as possible. You can use ECC. Uh, you can, of course, you can use less uh, less number of CAs and sub-CAs, but that probably you have a architecture that you want to use. Uh, you can, one number that, takes quite a lot in some certificate. It's subjective alternative names. If you have 50 or 100 of these, they take a large amount of space. Uh, and these are all general, would apply for any version of TLS. Then you can use mechanisms to reduce the sizes of the certificate messages. Uh, one thing that you can do in TLS is to omit 
certificates that you know that the other endpoint uh, knows about or has access to. In GLS 1.2 and earlier, you can only omit, uh, omit the top self-signed root CA. In TLS 103, you can omit any trust anchor. So basically everything except the server's own certificate. Um, yeah, so that's TLS 103 specific. Then you can should uh, use the cached information extension. That's uh, for all version of TLS. And then you can use extensions to reducing the size of certificates with compression. Uh, there's, this is not an RFC yet, there is work in progress in the TLS working group, and this is TLS 103 specific. But I think the idea to move this out into a separate is um, very good. Yeah. Some other smaller changes, OCSP handling in 103 is a little bit different. Uh, the OCSP information is sent inside uh, the certificate status messages instead. This means that you can send OCSP information for all certificates in the chain. Um, TLS strengthens confidentiality, key strengths, and cryptographic negotiation. So I made some slight updates to the security claim section uh, that applies when you use TLS 103. And then uh, the cipher suits are different so the must and should in the earlier versions does not apply basically these cipher suits are not available so for this draft i stay the current draft states that when you use tls 103 you follow the recommendations and must in tls 103 without changing anything and for earlier version of course it's rfc 5216 that applies next so I think after discussion on the list, I think this draft is in a pretty good shape. Would like even more feedback. Uh, uh, and then, of course, implementations. Uh, I, we have at Ericsson has not implemented it yet. We are discussing to start uh, implementation of it. It would be great if there was several implementation, we could test them against each other. And then I think uh, this should be adopted as a working group item. Okay, how, how many folks in this room have uh, read the draft? Okay, quite a few. Uh, does anybody have reasons why we shouldn't adopt this draft? Okay, so we'll, we'll take it to the list. But I think we'll we'll do that, I and mean, certainly we have a fair amount of uh, <coughs> excuse me of people reading the draft. But getting more reviewers would always be good. And we can also discuss. I think splitting it out. I I think does anybody feel we have to resolve the splitting out issue beforehand? I think that's something we can do in the working group, splitting out the uh, uh, certificate handling or the fragmentation. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks. All right. I think. I think next on the agenda we had Yari. Okay. So. Um, I'm going to talk about two drafts. Uh, one is sort of a bug fix and you know, accommodate some new situations that uh, uh, existing um, methods need to deal with. Another one is a, a real new uh, piece of functionality, a small, small piece of fu functionality to, to um, enhance something. Next slide. And uh, I mean, just uh, as, as a background, many of you are probably aware of this. I'll just uh, briefly cover that. But um, we obviously had uh, lots of work on EAP in you know back in the early 2000s or so. Um, and since then, um, not much has happened in terms of specifications. But there's been lots of deployment, um, and you know some amount of usage. I, I think the implementations of some of these technologies are in the billions in terms of uh, you know uh, existing smartphone clients and and, and such. 
um, uses usage, you know, maybe not as, at, at that quite at that level, but but fairly large uh, nevertheless. Um, and the thing that uh, you know in the in the past, how these things were used for the uh, EAP SIM and EAP AK type uh, authentication, the idea was that you could use operator uh, authentication infrastructure, but you would still come in through, um, like when, when you would connect through wireless LAN, then you, then you would use EAP and authenticate with EAP SIM or EAP AKA. And then if you came through uh, 4G, for instance, you would authenticate with the you know, na native mechanisms in, in the 4G um, uh, UE interface uh, protocol, and that, that's not EAP. But in 5G, this is going to change, so they will or they plan to allow both uh, EAP and uh, and this older, you know, direct uh, plane type of um, SIM card authentication on on the uh, UE interface. So when you're coming into 5G network, um, you could authenticate directly with um, EAP and obviously um, to support EAP AK Prime, which is the default mechanism there, but also potentially other other things like EAP TLS and and so forth. So that that's kind of the motivation of like what you know why are we talking about this this topic today at all? So that that's why it's important that we make sure that technology actually works in today's situation. We fix bugs and 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 so on. Next slide. So this first draft, um, the RFC fifty four four eight bis, um, is an update to EAP AKA Prime. And if you recall, so EAP AKA was was the uh, 3G um, authentication protocol, and it was enhanced with this um, in, in this prime version in uh, 5448, um, 2008, I think it came out. Um, and basically, the the idea there was that that this this provides better uh, binding to some of the parameters of the context that, that that the authentication is happening in. And 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 the draft that I have uh, written with my colleagues, it's a small update of of this EAPAK prime. Um, they are bugs in the current specification, things that we missed um, at the IETF at the time, uh, or specifying some behavior for situations that were not covered by by the uh, old um, old specs. And and there's a zero zero version that I was briefly mentioned or presented in in, in the previous IETF. There's a zero one version uh, where we as as we worked through you know this in in the you know, in, in various places at the 3GPP and, and ITF, and and also we realized that there's a couple of other issues also than than the one that was in zero zero zero, which was also only only about the binding, but this other stuff too. And and the idea here is don't add any functionality; just make sure that it actually works. Um, you know, as 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 the method has has been defined, and that that requires a couple of. Uh, tweaks or bug, bug fixes. Uh, but we could obviously update like security considerations when we learn, I mean, we've certainly learned of some um, attacks in the in the space of uh, uh, um, pervasive surveillance, for instance, that, that we could probably document here. But um, but security considerations is fair game. Adding new new features, I, I thought would be bad for, for this this particular draft. Next slide. Um, so so the three updates that are currently there, and, and since we have discovered a few it, it might be possible that you know that the list of three grows a little bit to four or five or something, um, and I, I want to work with you guys to to make sure that we got got everything. Um, so so the the first issue is this binding issue. So EAPAK binds the authentication to uh, uh, to the pr produced keys, um, so that you have some context information like we're we're doing this authentication for you know purpose blah, and then this. Uh, Purpose blah is defined through a reference that the old RFC points to a 3GPP spec that has a table that, you know, if, if you are doing wireless LAN authentication, then do this. And if you're doing something else, then do that and so forth. And now they're adding essentially a new new entry into the table, like 5G, then do this. And, uh, you know, on its own, this is like we're, we're pointing to a particular version, the RFC points to a particular version of the 3GPP spec. And now a future version of the, that same 3GPP spec um, it's going to say something something different. So you could, you know, perhaps if this was the only thing, we could perhaps let it slide and not not update. But I, I think it's actually a good practice to, like, if we have an actual interoperability issue, this would result in an interoperability issue that people can't talk to each other if they don't get the keys right. So um, it, it's good to update 
specs when when something like that happens, even if it's in in a reference, because it's so so important piece here. Uh, the other uh, thing is kind of like a 5G, 3GPP development that, that they used to have um, particular types of identifiers. And now in the new architects, they have added some new types. So, so they have um, these temporary identifiers and then they have more permanent identifiers and they play a different role than, than identifiers previously did in, in older systems or generations. And, and it's important because the, the identifier also goes into the key calculation. So if, if the identifier, one side thinks that the identifier is A and the other side think it's B, then that will be bad again. So, so we want to be absolutely clear that you shall use this ID as, as the ID. And there's a couple of different answers. It could be the actual ID that you sent on the EAP communications, or it could be the corresponding permanent identity. And there's arguments either way, but you know, I've, I went to the 3GPP meeting um, once or twice and realized that, oh, they are actually discussing this, like what would, would make sense here. And so, so I, I feel that the RFC actually needs to um, be updated to um, say what, 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 what's going on. Yeah, come on. Ben Kadek, uh, just you could consider using all of the IDs you know about if they're going to be known to all parties. I don't necessarily have to limit to just one. That is true, but I, I, I still want like exact same bit string on both sides, right? Um, and um, yeah, so th th that's a clarifying thing. I should also have mentioned that there's like ongoing work, work in, in, in 3GPP about like their new authentication architecture and there's, there's some appendix that has some text about EAP aka prime and how it should behave in, in 5G. And then the appendix also says, you know, when the RFC is ready, move this text to the RFC or let the RFC specify this. But but this is relatively urgent because they are actually doing this right now. So um, I, I would like to get uh, get uh, moving with the, with this particular draft. And and the final thing is this uh, session identifiers, which we've discussed on the on the list that actually applies to multiple uh, multiple uh, methods, uh, EAP SIM and AK and AK Prime. Um, so this particular draft actually fixes that for EAP AK Prime as well. Yeah, John Matson, Ericsson. Uh, now you update the 2008 reference to release 15 reference. When it seems like we will get into the same thing when 6, 6G is defined. If it is, is there any way to do this in a more generic way so that it's future proof? That that's an excellent question, and uh, we should we should figure that out. I mean, I, I think there are ways. I mean, we can refer to the spec or its future versions or whatever you know suitable language but but the question is what do we want like then then the a future change of this nature that the table changes and keys will be different and and nothing in the rfc indicates that so if that, if that's what we want we can make that happen but it might not be I, i'm not saying what the right answer here is but i'm just saying that there's there's several answers and we should decide yeah i had a similar thought and him i'm asking the question made me get up here um I'm Margaret Cullen from Painless Security. Um, it, one thing I'd think about is, you know, whether it makes sense for there to be an IANA registry that when 3G updates things, they put new values in, something like that, that we could refer to, since that seems like a, or if they have such a registry, we could refer to that. I, I don't know whether they have something like that, but that seems to be the way we normally solve that sort of problem, rather than yeah. updating the RFC over and over. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's that's also probably reasonable. Uh, it, it, it still doesn't get us away from like somebody has to update code. Like not normally when something like a new, new situation comes along, somebody can send an attribute and we can just ignore it. But this is very different because it actually goes into key calculation. So we can't really ignore it. We have to understand it. And now somebody needs to signal us that, oh, this is a new thing, new situation. Looking back, maybe I would have designed the protocol slightly differently, that it would actually be explicitly signaled somehow, but that's not that's not how, how it was done. Uh, I just think these updates are not going to be that frequent. That, like, we don't expect 6G anytime soon, so we can live with updating the, the RFC. Mm -hmm. For yourself, I, have, I expect it very soon, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, this is Alan again. Just one question about point three. Um, from a strictly timeliness perspective, it may also be interesting to just duplicate all those session identifiers in the session identifier document because that's really five paragraphs of text and implementations are depending on it now. I mean, it, it doesn't hurt to update the session identifiers for AKA Prime in two places. If one goes out in three months and the other goes out in a you know year and a half, it might be easier for implementers. Yeah, we, we, can, we can consider that. Thank you. Um, next slide. So um, next steps, where are we? Um, as I said, I, I think this is fairly urgent. Like in, in, you know, I would like to get this done in a couple of months. It's not a lot of specification work, just a few loose ends to um, take care of. Um, I would like to get this as, as a working group item as soon as possible. would like it you guys to tell us what, what other things we missed. And also, I'd like to work with the 3GPD people to figure out if they think we missed some. And, and, and by the way, there is some discussion going on with several people you know, overlapping participation on that. So, so that, that the coordination piece is probably under control, but, but it would be very helpful if others also participated. Uh, Margaret Cullen again. It's been, I don't know, 15 years since I read e AKA. So um, I don't remember what the security considerations say, but I think whatever we end up in this document should be accurate based on the current way we assess these sort of things. So I think you should update the security consideration section. Uh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a while to guess that we are better now at writing security consideration sections, or at least I hope so. <laughs> So how, how many folks have uh, read this document? One, not quite as many. Um, so I'm not going to ask if there are any objections since people haven't really read it, but we'll we'll bring that up on the list as soon as we can because there's no it doesn't it seems like it should be uh, pretty straightforward. Um, okay. Well, well, I guess I will ask: Is there anybody who thinks there's something would object to taking this document in this room? Just so we can get it out if there's there. Okay. So we'll take that to the list. OK. The other draft was um, actual new functionality, and, and it's optional functionality. Um, so perfect forward secrecy. And, and, and the background for this is I, I mentioned it in the previous um, uh, IETF. Um, the, the, uh, the, the issue is that there's been reported cases of uh, um, intelligence agencies stealing large amount of you know, potentially like all, all the keys from a SIM card manufacturer. Um, and then uh, if they have those keys and there's no perfect forward secrecy, then essentially at any time they can look at the traffic later. And um, since this was discovered, there's been obviously lots of concern about it and people have done stuff. They've taken care of security between the manufacturer and the operator better. They've improved their processes in manufacturing plants. They've you know, tightened up everything possible. But still, the, I mean, the opportunity for this um, remains. I mean, at, at, at the end of the day, you can you know, hand somebody a national uh, security letter or something, and, and they'll have to comply. So if we had some technical means of, of dealing with this problem, it would be good. Next slide. And. Um, so what we've done here is, is essentially a, um, so Draft Arco EAP AK PFS um, is, is a backwards compatible ex extension on top of EAP AK Prime. That's a Diffie-Hellman exchange. Um, and then the output keys uh, from EAP will now provide uh, perfect forward secrecy. Um, and if there is a compromise of, of the previously described nature, then, then um, you know that that's still a bad thing, but but if, if uh, intelligence agency wants to use those keys and look at the traffic, they actually have to be active attackers and not just passive attackers. So so that that's forcing them to do more, and and that that that's a good thing. Generally considered a a, a reasonable thing. Um, there's tons of details. I, I don't go through that. Hopefully, people can read the draft and 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 look at the details. Um, it can probably be done in multiple different ways. There's been some discussion in 3GPP about this. Uh, I mean, also about this, doing it in EAP, but also some other other approaches. We think this is a reasonable approach, um, given that you know, if if you 
cover TLS and PFS and cover uh, EAP AK and PFS. You pretty much covered, uh, you know, a very large fraction of all practical use cases for some of those networks. Um, and then there's some other other um, alternative designs where you th do things in the local network. And, the, and but the downside with those approaches is that then then whatever high quality keys you get out of that, they are left in the local network. Whereas in some of these systems, you might actually want to have the terminal and the home network also discuss uh, with each other. And, and using these high quality PFS protected keys. And so um, it's possible with this, this kind of design, sort of backwards compatible fashion. Um, should mention that there's an IPR notice on this, this draft. Uh, probably should also mention that there was some IPR by somebody on, um, on RFC 5448 also. Um, and also should mention that this uh, perfect forward secrecy thing is discussed in 3CPP. But they have this two phases. This phase one, which is like ongoing right now, and it's going to finish in five months or six months or something like that. Um, and then there's phase two, and 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 the perfect forward secrecy thing is in phase two. That that's not something that they can do in in this um, time scale. So if if we complete this in um, in a reasonable uh, fashion in in IETF or have some solution in IETF for this, then they could take use of that in in their next release. Not the, not the one that they're currently uh, feverishly working on. Next slide. So I'm going to argue here that it's important that we actually enhance our protocols to uh, respond to these um, massive attacks um, by various organizations. And uh, there seems to be demand for this in the uh, mobile industry. So that's good. Um, an opportunity to do, do things right. So I would also like to argue this thing to come to the working group. Um, maybe a little, with a little bit less urgency than the previous one. That that one I really need <laughs> done soon. Um, and uh, and the coordination thing again is important and and ongoing. That's it. Hey, Aaron Kapabel uh, for your ideas. Same as Alan. Um, so there's a long-standing issue in EPK and EPSIM and the rest, and that the permanent IDs are revealed the first time the supplicant authenticates. Um, if there's appetite for sort of doing perfect forward sequency and really sort of stopping state actors finding out information about uh, UEs, is there any appetite in fixing that? Um, I'm sorry, I, I, I so couldn't completely hear or understand that. They said, what are revealed in the authentication? The IMSI number of the SIM card is revealed. Ah, OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there is. And that that's the thing that I was on the previous presentation talking about, that they have this temporary ID and then then the more permanent ID, and now they're fixing that. They, oh, they right. have fixed okay. it. So okay. that's good. <laughs> right. John Matsong, so already in phase one, it's now mandatory to support curve 25519 for encryption of your identity. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, obviously, there's tons of details about that, that fix because the core of the core will still know who you are but but you know maybe people on the on on you know elsewhere will not not learn it as easily as they did before and so how many folks have read this draft okay one or two okay um and so with the coordination with 3gpp it seems like they're still kind of uh you know settling towards an approach is, is how like do they have a timeline for this phase two and when they would decide that and i think the phase two is gonna finish a year from now okay am i getting that right um but i mean i i, I mean as a general approach i don't think we at the itf should like necessarily i mean we should respect people's timelines but we should do our own homework that, that we have a protocol right. we're going to fix it for these and these reasons and then it's available for people to use if they sure. so desire but if you know if, if they need something and we don't have something ready by that time then that could be a problem too yeah, yeah. okay so uh i think well does anybody have any other comments on this draft I, mean, I think we need some more discussion on the list and you know uh 
you didn't ask for adoption here or you do you want to wait a bit on that to bake it more or i thought i did ask for adoption i'm just uh, okay. expressing a urgency difference between the, the previews and those. okay so then we can we can queue them up then okay All right, we're cranking through the agenda here, and I think Alan is next with session identifiers. Hopefully, this should be pretty quick. Um, next slide. You might need to get closer to the mic. Uh, so there's the session ID, just for recap, um, defines that. If we go to the next slide, um, it says they must define these things and people like to ignore musts. So if we go to the next one, um, each session ID has not been defined for fast reauthentication for SIM and AKA, and no session ID derivation was defined for AKA prime or PEEP. Um, the charter could probably be updated to add PEEP if we care. I've gone through a bunch of the other EEP RFCs. They all look okay, but it wouldn't hurt to double check that. We'll go to the next slide. Um, the TLS-based EAT methods don't have this problem. Um, they cache the TLS information. You can always derive the session IDs for re-authentication. Um, Non-TLS EAT methods require different things, so this is, I suspect, why it was missed. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the vendor-specific EAT methods have similar problems, um, but it's their, their issue to fix. Um, specifically, this is needed for ERP and fills for um, IEEE 802.11ai. Um, next slide. So this is the proposal um, based on Uni's comments to the mailing list. Um, EAP AKA, AKA Prime, SIM, and PEEP. Um, and that's really the bulk of the content of the document with some paragraphs around it. Uh, Bernard. Yeah, Bernard Bubba. W one way that um, y you might consider fixing this in the future was if there was an IANA registry, then basically IANA would have checked all these documents at, for the allocations and made sure they didn't miss them. Yeah. So, that, so that might be something to consider as having this document establish a registry, populate it with all that stuff, and then the good folks at IANA will check you know, going forward. So you don't have to do this again, like in another five years. Oh, they, you know, these documents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. I'm yeah, I think some, some of these were published before we did the session ID, I think, maybe, or um, I think AK and SIM. But uh, yeah, and some were after. But um, Next slide. So specifically, this will update uh, 5247, 4186, 487, 5448, 5247. Um, and I suspect based on my earlier comment for AKA Prime, it doesn't hurt to put the text in this document. And if they get published at the same time, we can just delete it from this document. Um, and if AKA Prime starts being contentious, then I don't know. Next slide. Any questions? Hopefully, barring IANA registry updates, this thing really should be a couple of pages. I didn't have time to get it done before ITF, but I'll get it done next week. Um, and if there's no IANA registry updates, uh, it could be published effective immediately so long as people review it and like it. Um, if there are IANA update registries or registry updates, that will take a little longer, I suspect. Okay. So we'll be waiting on a draft. I, I don't know if anybody, did anybody want to discuss the issue of whether the AKA Prime uh, thing should go in this draft or not, or do we just wait and see how things progress? Okay, we'll just wait and see. All right. I think this means... Did I not? Oh, here we go. All right, Elliot has some questions for us. 
And he's going to probably tell us a little bit about this brewski thing. Hi, I'm not as tall as Alan. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm Elliot Lear. Uh, I've been working on uh, onboarding of little things, and some sometimes big things, uh, with a bunch of people who are in the room. Um, and uh, so we've been mo most of our stuff we've, we've been focusing on in, in either ops area working group or in um, the animal working group. Um, and, and it's all about uh, a lot of it's about trusted introduction and um, figuring out uh, what this thing is and, and how we're supposed to protect it from a network perspective. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm sort of new to EAP, OK? Um, that is to say, uh, I'll admit it, I know very little. So um, I figured I'd come to the experts um, as we begin to sort out some of our problems. And there's not even a draft yet for, you know, in terms of a specification, but we're, we're beginning to sort ourselves in terms of trying to figure out uh, not only the problem space, but closer to the solution space. Uh, next slide. So that's my way of saying be gentle. Um, so uh, we have this fundamental problem. We, we, we've actually done a fair amount of work for Wired and can onboard devices. The, there's a person who's not in the room, actually, uh, Michael Richardson, who's been leading a lot of work in uh, the animal working group to basically do a trusted introduction between um, a device and a local deployment where the device, or what you might call the EAP peer, um, has a very limited ability to retain um, uh, uh, things like a certificate store, a trust root store. Maybe they have one or two or three cert, uh, space for one or two or three certs at most. They certainly don't have anything like what you'd find in a browser. Okay? They just don't have the space for that. And to give you an idea, I've had arguments uh, with people over you know, using five to 80 bytes you know, and, and on processor capabilities uh, that, that range all the way down to uh, an 8086 or a Z80. So you, you threw out that Z80 book already, right? Guess what? <laughs> it's all back. So um, we sort of sorted this, as I mentioned, for wireless, but for, uh, for wired. But for wireless, we have a couple of problems, only some of which are this organization's issue. Um, and and it, it really goes like this. We've defined this wonderful flow that says, um, you know, let's do this little dance with a nice little restful interface between the device and the local deployment um, which we call a registrar here, and the local deployment and the manufacturer, uh, uh, which is a somewhat optional step, to say let's let that manufacturer do a trusted introduction for the device and the and the local deployment. This is really nice, and of course, to do that little dance, you sort of have to have some connectivity uh, to the device. But if you're on a wireless network you know, with an 802.11 network, you have a, a very limited connectivity and probably no IP connectivity until you have credentials. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. And so we're trying to, to, to sort out, um, uh, to, to break out from the chicken and egg problem. And there are a couple different ways to do this um, that, that we're sort of exploring. And there's a draft, and I'll point you at it later to just mention you know, what the problem space looks like. And so 802.11u, for, in, uh, for instance, has a, uh, an AMQP extension, which essentially says, Here, here's some TLBs. You guys can talk in some structured way before you actually do um, a communication. And actually, there's um, something similar, uh, you know, in terms of doing network identifications, 802.11aq. Uh, we're not entirely thrilled with that either, as it turns out. Um, there, we're pondering using TEEP uh, to do this, which is why I'm here. And uh, just to get, uh, at least to get the, to identify the right network, we're thinking of doing something with device provisioning protocol, um, which is work being done in the Wi-Fi Alliance. Again, that's not something we have to worry about here. Um, and we, we, we are pondering the, the use case where you, know, you have uh, an EPTLS-based mechanism, and maybe you have other EAP methods as well. And we're not really far along with the other EAP methods, but um, we, we started with an EPTLS use case. Next slide, please. So um, here's my understanding of, of, of TEEP. You have sort of an outer TLS uh, communication. This is work that, uh, many, uh, that was probably done in this working group. Um, you have an outer uh, TLS, which you can defer um, uh, the auth authentication of the endpoints until, uh, until just before you're, you're ready to send back an EAP success. Um, you have something of an inner, um, and you can use all these lovely methods inside that, that nice wrapping, which we like. Um, you have an EST-like enrollment mechanism, 
um, and you have a, an ability to get back trusted server routes, this is all good stuff. One thing you just lack is this trusted introduction, so we want to do an extension for, for the trusted introduction. Next slide, please. Uh, so now, Anima is that trusted introduction. I think I probably have covered everything in this, in, in, in this slide array. So um, uh, the basic idea is you want to end up in an end state, uh, at an end state where the client has at least one trusted uh, element in the local deployment that it can retrieve more information from, um, where it had no contact with the, uh, with the initial deployment already. And you know, don't think laptop, think light bulb when you're, when you're pondering this problem, okay? There's no user interface uh, on the device at all. Uh, next slide, please. So in, in, in exploring TEEP, right, some of the things that we've been looking at is actually TEEP says you can roll in um, EAT methods underneath. There's a nice little TLV defined for that. This is nice um, because it's very clear how you do a, an, intermediate, an intermediate result. In fact, there's a, an example given in RFC 7170 of exactly how to do that. Well, goody, I could just do that. Um, on the other hand, um, if you create a new eat method, mm, that means it's, you know, somebody might get this misguided idea that you should um, do the new eat method without the outer layer um, protection that T provides, and then they have a choice. They can either do an additional outer layer, layer for themselves or worse, they don't do anything and you end up with some weird exposure in a, in a, in a vendor method. We, that poses uh, some small problems. Um, on the other hand, we can create uh, new TEEP TLVs, and this guarantees that the thing's only used with TEEP, right? So you get the outer layer protection. Um, but there's a little bit of confusion that we have. Maybe it's not in the draft, maybe it's just in Elliot's head and, and other people's heads, as to how to do the intermediate um, uh, results uh, with, uh, with a method. Next slide, please. So, um, to give you an idea of sort of the sample flow, and this is just a sample, and it's incomplete, that, that we're thinking about, right? And yeah, this is an eye chart. Um, you know, you go through, you do your nice little hellos, and so at some point, right, you come to determine that maybe you uh, actually need to get a deployment cert, and if you don't, you can skip this part, and if you, and, and go right to, say, each success, right, if, if you like that. If you, if you know the... Um, if, if you have a local deployment root cert, and, um, but the, the server says, oh, you might need to re-enroll, maybe you skip the, the, the Brewski stuff. Um, but otherwise, we define essentially a new method that we're currently thinking about in, in terms of TEEP um, to, to essentially do a voucher request, um, which is this is an Anima construct that um, uh, there are several different drafts to do this, and then a voucher response, right? at which point you then go on to do a local registration using the nice little mechanisms that are already in a T. So all we want to do is, uh, at this point, is a pretty small extension, um, or what we think is a pretty small extension. Um, who knows uh, if, if, if we're right about that. Next slide, please. OK, so uh, I mentioned there was a draft. There's a draft. Um, and so we've, we've defined a bit of a problem statement. Um, and uh, you know, we look at a bunch of different methods. Um, and so we're seeking, it's a seeing, we're seeking uh, a discussion about what's the best way forward. Now, to put this in a little bit of context, we have really good uh, um, technical people in this room, and we want to start here, but the overall solution probably has to deal with a pretty broad base of characters, like the people who make the light bulbs, or the people who do um, these little devices here that look you know, like the, the smoke detectors or things like that, or the monitors. So it's a pretty broad problem that we have to think about from an industry perspective. Um, and so we want to take it, you know, reasonably deliberate and, and try and figure out the right thing. Um, one question we have is whether TEEP is actually a useful tool here. Um, it looks nice, okay? The document, the mechanisms that are provided look really good. The problem is there's not a lot of adoption, as Alan pointed out in the Ops Area Working Group, and that does concern us. Um, and just so you know, Alan, like I did these slides before you said that, okay? Um, and so we're, we're, we're concerned about that. Um, yeah, this, this, this is Alan. Um, my, my two cents is EAP is probably the right mechanism, as you're saying, 5G is moving to EAP and said, don't invent your own thing. 
some TLS based method is probably the right thing. Inventing your own crypto is is evil and wrong. Right. I would probably argue that it's better to do it with Teep and just sort of push people to use that than to try to patch one of the other eat methods. Um, Teep isn't that complicated and, you know, suck it up, people, get it done. Yeah, I mean, it sort of looks, it, it smells right, Bernard. <laughs> Yeah, Brown, Brown. I, th I think the thing to think about is kind of all the dependencies for all the use cases and, you know, the environments you think of this using it. Will I have EAP or are they not? Or is it like a consumer light bulb you're selling to somebody, a grandmother or something? So that's probably the more pertinent question to just figure out what you're likely to have in your kind of environment. Yeah. Um, it doesn't actually say it on my badge, but I work at Cisco. And our focus is primarily on an enterprise use oh, case. Oh, so they will be in that. They'll so have all it's that definitely okay. in, in, in the ETH territory. But as I mentioned in the beginning, right, we also want to we also want to have answers for the the, uh, the other use cases. But maybe that's not EPish, right? That you know, if you look at a light bulb and the way things happen, or, or like the ring doorbell is a perfect example, right? They create their own APs and such, and and then you you can just onboard in a consumer way like that, but. You know, one of the area directors was frustrated in his own house. He's having difficulty with, with all this stuff because he's got a lot of equipment. Yeah, this, this is Alan again. Um, not having, you know, manufactured light bulbs or anything, but doing security, my, my two cents would be suck it up, right? This is how we know to do it right. Mm -hmm. Anything else is very likely to be wrong. Um, and if they don't have enough CPU, you probably shouldn't be on the net. Right. If you can't if you can't do this kind of stuff securely, unless someone's going to come up with a zero CPU TLS, you know, encryption, whatever TLS method, then we don't know how to do it right other than this. So just just to give you a little flavor for the constraints, when I talk to partners about this, what they say, what they're aiming for is they don't they want to minimize the amount of code that they can't reuse. So. They are they are looking at DTLS, for instance, and so there's a TLS stack that they're probably aiming at. So we can probably do something in that space. The more heavy, the heavier it is, the heavier the anima part is, the heavier the E part is. That stuff, since that code is only used on onboarding and probably like you know these guys are probably all on all the time, at least at that level, right? Yeah. You do like an authentication a month or something like that, or an authentication every couple of months whenever the power goes out in a room or something like that you know then they get they, they get a little bit antsy because the you know that's code that they they only had to use this much and it took up this much space and that's something we can't solve for them and, and we're not going to try to solve it here to be clear okay he really is tall <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> Nancy Kim wins it. Uh, so, so just to add on, so fully agree, which is why Elliot is mentioning TEEP. So I'm also from Cisco, been working with Elliot on this. So I was just going to add the motivation for why EAP is as we're onboarding this, it's not just the enterprise, but trying to leverage the fact that we're onboarding on a wireless medium, that being Wi-Fi. So it became natural that if we're going to do Wi-Fi, there is already the definition of using that one X and therefore EAP. The addition that we have in here, I just wanted to add <clears throat> to what Elliot is mentioning, is when you look at Brewski, the thing that Brewski is adding is that voucher request response, ergo EAP has a request response. So a natural place, and that's the question mark for the group, is we could add into TEEP the specification for doing that voucher request. And we bantered it on, is it a separate EAP method? Likely not if we can do it with an EAP. The other question is, when being an author of TEEP, right, the messages that we put in there for the certificate enrollment is just for that, whereas EST is broader. Ergo, the question of when we do the full and, and encourage you to look at the Brewski is um, whether we need to extend the TEEP to do what EST really does or just reference EST, which then gets to the question of channel binding. 
Thank you, Nancy. That was that was well put, Margaret. Uh, Margaret Collin again. Um, I I actually have a couple of questions. I didn't author TEEP or run the EAP working group or implement free radius. So, you know, I, <laughs> I had trouble understanding the picture. I don't know if you go back to the picture um, because I'm wondering, you get this thing and you go, we might say yes from here or we might go to the MASA server. Now, is that an inner method that's going to do some sort of communication so, with the MASA server? All right, uh, let's see here. This is wireless, right? <laughs> okay. Time to deep dive. And by the way, the person behind you can really deep dive, just so that you know, <laughs> he, he's the Brewski guy. Um, I mean, I did look at it on my phone before this meeting, and I didn't understand it then either. So I'm. All right. So, <laughs> um, I'm not going to again. Uh, I'm not. I'm not the expert on TEEP either, which is why I came to you guys. So I'm going to give you my best interpretation. Everybody, you know, can get up and say, "Ooh, that's wrong," but and, and I'll happily take that. Right. So we, we start out. We do the normal. EAP dance with EAP TLS. This is, or I should say, TEEP dance here, right? This is where we're starting in this discussion. Mm -hmm. So you have a client hello, a server hello. And so there's a decision point actually up here. It's not, it shouldn't be down here, it should be up here. If the client and the, and I think these might actually be reversed if I'm looking at this correctly. Um, if the client and the server know each other, then in your code path, the servers, if the server has the ability, I think at that point, to just send back EAP success if, if, if life is good, right? And then you can just bypass all this other stuff. If the server has some reason to not send an EAP success, EAP success there could be two reasons for that. Uh, one is that it doesn't recognize anything from the client. Um, then uh, it, could, it, it could then say, okay, continue down the flow. And it could also, it, it could do, and, and it does this with essentially the, requ the EAP request frames. Um, and so that's our, our understanding of the logic um, behind that. And so that's where you get branching in this context. That, does huh. that explain things a little a bit? A little bit. I mean, I, I sort of did this is the case the first time you come on, and, and there's no caching and there's no anything. Right. What I'm not getting the is the part where the request goes to the master server, right? So you've got a, a AAA server, and the AAA server is talking to you, right? But at this point, is the AAA server going to do some, like, on the inner tunnel, going to do a request to the master server that the triple A server gets an answer to, and then answers you based on it, or is the request forward in some way where the master server now talks to the client? Yeah, I don't have the full picture here. That's sort of intentional. Yeah, I mean because otherwise it gets really messy. But because your channel is, binding question becomes very complicated if you're going to change who you're talking to, and I'm so you're all you're always talking to the authentication server okay the authentication server is going to forward a request on your behalf to this thing called a masa server and then it's going to respond and that request itself is signed um, by the masa server in such a way that the peer will recognize the signature for authorization and authentication for this purpose so you have sort of a almost a, a degenerate tunnel there where the signatures are effectively creating a bit of a tunnel to the master server. For yes. The, yeah. And okay. the person who designed all that is right behind you. Okay. No, I'm just, I wanted to, I, I tried to understand this and I, I couldn't. And so now I think I'm starting to get what you're, what you're talking I, about. I apologize for the abbreviated uh, flow here. I, I would recommend uh, figure one from the Brewski draft, which should align in your head pretty quickly. If not, I'm happy to talk about yeah, it further. I see these slides pretty yep. soon enough to read them. I'm sorry, this is Max Bertigan. Uh, we might have moved on a little bit, but I wanted to address the question around um, bringing Brewski into this space as opposed to other use cases. And the Anima yes. use case is around uh, the broader context of uh, autonomic networking, so it's kind of network devices and how they would be set up and work together. The um, ACE working group is taking that and moving it into constrained space, so they're doing some of the definitions to move a voucher, the, the blob that we're talking about that's signed that has to be gotten from the master server. They're doing work to convert that into a format that's better for constrained environments, which would also work a little bit better because it's a uh, COSA based, et cetera, would be uh, a little bit better for within the flows, maybe. Um, as opposed to the, uh, the the broader CMS message signing mechanism. So what we're really addressing here is just the use cases of where you have EAP and network access control, which is the wireless and other spaces. 8 to 11, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exa precisely so. Yeah. And so to, to just to come back to the, the questions, right, um, you know, we, we don't, we're, I think 
Alan answered in, in a relatively uh, assertive way, yeah, eat it and do teeth. And that's where my head is, because if, if we don't do that, we're going to recreate something that looks an awful lot like teeth, is, is my concern. Though perhaps with a little bit of, you know, if, if we recreate a method, it could, it could be a little bit of Jose, Jose glue, you know, magic pixie dust instead of, instead of what's there today. And maybe that's the right thing to do, because we might be able to leverage what the ACE people are doing with their flows at which point we do have to toss away teeth, but that's a whole lot more work than I want to do. And I want to make it clear that I am a fundamentally lazy person, so I prefer to use other people's code and not have to wait for it. Um, so I'm lazy and demanding uh, in that regard. Um, so uh, then the next question that, that Nancy addressed, right, is, um, is sort of a, a, two, a two sets of questions. First of all, we have this very um, this one message that's available to us in EAP to do enrollment. The question is, do we want to break out and start and, and, and take a better look at EST to see if there are other messages that are necessary, or should we break out of the, should we do some sort of EAP success and then break into and, and, and have devices end up in a sandbox environment, which sounds a lot more complex. There are all sorts of different possibilities that we, we could traverse here, but one of the reasons we like EAP in, in terms of doing all this is the client stack component that deals with this is relatively compartmentalized and you don't bop an interface up at an L3 level and then bop it down and then bop it up again ba based on uh, your, your provisioning state, which might confuse upper layer applications, which is something that we're a little bit concerned about. Um, so again, it, it, it demonstrates the, the full value of, of EAP. And then of course, um, uh, the other thing we're thinking is once you're up and running, you, you might not want to wait for an EAP transactions to, uh, EAP transaction to do your re-enrollment. And the registrar is supposed to be available for this purpose, but you might not know the IP address of the registrar because this would, would abstract that out from you, whereas it's available, in, it, it's, it's discovered in the Anima use case in, in other ways. So that's some thinking that, that needs to be done in terms of, in terms of that. And there are other aspects here too, which is that um, we have constantly thought about ways in the Anima working group to me where, where you might want to piggyback additional information back to the, what we call here the peer, um, such as um, a, a good example in, in the constrained space is that people are looking for a co-op resource directory. How, would, how could we pass back you know, one or two bits of information that might be useful to the client um, in this context, and this relates also just because, you know, I, I think broadly, though not necessarily deeply on these things. Um, we're also looking at the work being done in the T DHC working group, which is looking to do Yang models for all of the DHCP uh, options, and some of those we might want to pass back as well in this process. There's limitations to that because some of that information is very, very localized to a particular network that a AAA server might not even have access to. So we have to be particular about that, but these are the, some, of the, some of the things that we're pondering. And so that leads to the next question as we're going through all this. Um, a particularly mysterious thing to me is channel binding. Um, and so we're, I just heard, I heard that. I'm gonna repeat what Jim said. That's gonna be a pain. When has it ever not been <laughs> is my question. So, um, Anyway, I have just one question for the, uh, for the group left over, which is, is this something that you would be interested in working with me on? Um, I have one other comment before that question, uh, or I mean, you can ask the question, but I, it's not about that question, uh, which is that you said there's the possibility of doing something where you do EAP and you get limited access and then you do some other protocol. And I know that sounds complicated. Um, it, also has the advantage of being nicely incrementally deployable. That you could go into a corporate network, some group wants to do this, they plop up their server, they run their devices, and they don't have to get the um, EAP infrastructure, all of the access points and access controllers and stuff updated. Sure. And if you don't do it that way, then you have the problem that you've either got to run other wireless access points in order to do incremental deployment, which most um, employers would not be pleased by, or you've got to somehow get your your corporation to update the infrastructure 
before you can use this. And I wondered what you thought about that. Yeah, so the, it, it, I won't speak for other vendors. Um, Cisco has a notion, which I'm sure others do, called Mac Authenticated Bypass, which essentially allows for these sorts of, of incremental deployments. So you have devices that do, maybe don't understand EEP, maybe that you, maybe you have to learn them in other ways, learn about them in other ways. And that's just one example where, yeah, you might end up getting sandboxed initially, and then you do have to deal with these things. And Max is going to, I'm sure, going to talk more. Okay. That wasn't actually my, my point. My point was that you're going to make these devices, and they do understand EAP, but you're going to expect these EAP extensions in order to get onto the network. And if I just walked into a Cisco office today, these things not being defined, those wireless access points don't have those EAP extensions. So I could get, do the beginnings of EAP, but then I couldn't actually get on the network. That's but right. And wouldn't those extensions go in the AAA? I mean, the AAA is is where EAP terminates, not in the access point in most yeah, but cases. The, yeah, that, there's that a question of whether you've got to get the corporate network to update their AAA infrastructure, sure, sure. or whether you could put a server up on the network, get in and just have them um, put that server on the same VLAN where they're giving you sandbox access if you come in as one of these devices. And I don't know which of those is better. It was just my mm -hmm. my comment. It's a fair, it's a fair comment. I, you know. I, I, and, and I'm not even going to. I'm not even going to begin to say I have a good answer for it. Right? We're just getting going. Just a comment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Max Pritikin, uh continuing that conversation, I wonder about the if if we put it onto a quarantine VLAN, how does the device know that it's in the wrong spot and know to try other SSIDs and roll forward, and maybe uh, a more structure around whether or not the method succeeds or fails because it got the right stuff or didn't or didn't have the right extensions might make that process fail over faster to find the right spot it's supposed to be at. So just so that we're clear, right? my understanding of EAP is that one of the nice things about it is you have a way to send a soft fail in, uh, to, in, in the protocol and where the server can then try other things. And I suspect we'll see some of that at work here. But we might, I'm not, and I don't know how far we'll have to go in a specification on that front. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this is this is quite interesting and an interesting problem space. Um, certainly, um, not sure about all the de technical details, but uh, me neither. But uh, <laughs> one comment that I, I would provide is that, at least in my experience, it's it's often useful to keep sort of the EAP to do the thing that it was originally designed to do to to authenticate in various different ways, and then use other other mechanisms for delivering configuration information. Um, and uh, I mean, that, that's my experience and, and I, that's, that would be my advice. I realize that people don't always listen to my advice and there certainly are people who've done, um, not, you know, not followed this particular advice. So, and, and they're like, right now there's some people somewhere else who are doing something um, exactly against that advice. But uh, the, I, I, I would, you know, r rather see a sort of a clean, stack in in some sense i mean okay. uh, enrollment is fine but but like this configuration of various other other things maybe not the right place so i i think there's um thank you yari uh I th the the key thing i just want to bring out there that use case is really really it's hitting us hard in, in a couple of different deployments where the you don't have dns in some of these spaces um you yet you do have a little bit of Epishness, as it were, and so the people are looking, and, and what they're using instead of DNS or planning to use instead of DNS is really the co-op resource directory, and uh, to 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 locate various devices, and so they need one little hook, and but of course once you say one little hook, everybody has their own one little hook they want to find, and so we, this could grow into a monster, and that would be the thing that I would be concerned about. And when I mentioned DHCP, that's just the monster you were thinking about, I'm sure. There are more nodes on the network that just want to find the DNS in an NTP server than want to find a co-op directory. And we've never let them put those things in here. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, 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 it, there, there's um, tons of ways of discovering stuff, you know, multicast addressing. And, and you know, I, I've done some work on um, Co-op resource directories, and and, and that's not. I, I don't think that's a intractable pr problem. Also, in other other ways. Okay. Um, and, and 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 the the other comment I would make is that like the 
we see this a lot, like, you know, we can't have DNS, we can't have this or that, but then we also do certificates and, and certificate chains, and it's, yep. it, it's, yep, it's yep. a little funny <laughs> because... What people think is important, you know, in different use cases, right? But let me take as uh, the, the conclusion from this discussion, um, when that comes up is that these are not the droids you are looking for when we talk about it, okay? Yeah, I think the other thing you might want is to have all that other stuff work on a network that isn't an EAP network. And that's, you know, so that's the other thing you want to take totally into fair. account. And I, I, I'm i interested in this, and I at least like to follow it regarding your question of work and would review stuff. I don't have resources to implement or anything. Well, and so, again, uh, I, I think we're – thank you, Joe and, and group, for so much time, by the way, for this. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Um, I think I like the idea of scoping it down just that much um, because it, it, we, it keeps us from boiling the ocean. And so I, I really do appreciate the advice. What, um, I, what I wanted to just close with is just to point out that my, my co-conspirator is sitting there in the back, Owen Friel, who's right behind Alan. And um, right in front of Alan is Brian Weiss, who, who, who gets suckered into implementing a, a bunch of this stuff too. And of course, Nancy. So we're all trying to, all of us are trying to figure this out, working with different partners, and this will have to be an industry solution. It can't be a, it, it, and, a and a broad industry solution be going beyond the IETF. So there's a fair amount of uphill lifting here if we take this approach. Whatever approach we take, there will be uphill lifting um, for all of this. And we have to also work with, uh, I think, probably the IEEE in this space to figure out the other problem, which is how do I choose what network to join in an 802.11 sense? I don't think they're quite done there, quite frankly. Yeah. And I'll just point out, uh, I'll also, also give one more bit of credit. I'd like to thank um, Dan Harkins, who also uh, gave a lot of comment on this uh, topic as well as he was going for. Uh, Dorothy Stanley, Hewlett Packard Enterprise. To your last comment, Elliot, about uh, the work in dot eleven not being quite done from a discovery point of view, uh, I would be, and I would, I think the Dot 11 working group would be delighted to hear your comments in that regard. And I would encourage you to put together a presentation and bring that to Dot 11 to describe the use cases that you're looking at that are not completely addressed. I'm going to sucker him to do that because he already goes to 802. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know who him was, but. Or, or, or we, have, we have some people to do that, but. Yes, yeah. I, I think it's a fair point. I can't just throw darts without right. actually. So please, I think uh, it's fair. Come and, um, By the way, I do appreciate the work us. that they have done, like like AQ, as I mentioned, and the, the of course you know the Wi-Fi alliances work with DPP, which I think is directly yeah, relevant. Yeah, which here. Dan has done a lot of work on. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, I, I think you know that there sounds like there's some interesting discussion that could happen. I think certainly paring down or compartmentalizing what you want to do, like perhaps working on enrollment or improving their enrollment in there would be a good thing. But I think you guys need to, we need to kind of figure out what's the right direction here for this sort of thing. So um, take, having taken this input, um, it's now up to us to actually put out a draft because um, otherwise we'll, we'll continue to speak in generalities and, and who likes that? So um, if you're interested in, in taking part of that effort, drop Owen or me an email. And um, we're particularly, you know, additional advice on channel binding, always welcome, because as Jim said before he left, it's a pain, or it's going to be a pain. OK, thanks very much for your time. All right. Does anybody else have any other things they want to discuss with respect to EMU today? If not, you can have some time back. All right, we are adjourned. And if I could have the blue sheets. I have one blue sheet. Thank you. Yeah, yeah but that's uh, 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 uh
All right, back at ETH again. <laughs> you mean that report? I was charity view and we closed it when we started it in 2000 and whatever, and we closed it in 2013. <laughs> There was EAP, and then there was EMU, and then there was uh, now EMU again.